Hello everyone, thank you again for watching another one of these videos on the weekend. I, I hope to not make a habit of this past this point. Um, this has been mostly a, an attempt to try to speed along this ethical theory crash course as I've been talking about many times in class before. Um, <clears throat> and we, But we, uh, we definitely still have some more stuff about Kant that just strikes me as so important. I've been reflecting constantly this week about Oh, what can we skip? Can we move on? And and there's just some stuff that I think we absolutely need to do. We got a lot of good work done on Friday in cashing out the categorical imperative and how it gets like the blood from the stone sort of thing. Um, and I want to follow up on that a little bit more. Uh, revisit the theme of happiness. Um, talk about Kant and social justice and like what would a a Kantian approach to um, <clears throat> political issues look like, try to anticipate some of that stuff, talk about the connection with human rights, and then also talk a little bit about Kant and uh, immorality. And there, there's a lot of interesting connections to make here. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to say uh, is maybe not um, orthodox Kantian, uh, if that if that makes sense. Like Some of this is going to definitely reflect um, my take on Kant. And some, and emphasizing some things that I think often get lost in considering Kantian ethics, especially when it's presented in a more superficial sort of way. Um, but uh, one of those themes it, it, I, I mentioned on uh, Friday about Kantian care. Kant isn't the philosopher most people think of when they think about care, and in fact. Um, there's been a resurgence, um, or I, I don't even know if a resurgence is right the right word here, a, a sort of movement uh, in feminist ethics over the last few decades um, that has challenged that uh, the traditional moral theories of Western philosophy are very um, masculine-driven or about the, the masculine experience and worldview rather than... Um, uh, a female or feminine uh, approach and a lot of those feminist ethics have revolved around this theme of care so feminist care ethics is a is a thing and Kant has been like a kind of a whipping boy for this sort of stuff um, that Kant is so driven by this emphasis on reason um, emotion is not emphasized as much you know the, these kind of um, uh, easy observations to make about Kant, but which I've been trying to challenge a little bit along the way. Like I've mentioned in class how Kant is, a Kantian ethicist is going to actually need to have a great degree of emotional intelligence. Um, and there's plenty of room to create uh, maxims or principles for that guide action that are sensitive to emotional things. But <clears throat> the aspect of care is sometimes lost here. Like for Kant, all the language is about duty and obligation and things like that. But there, I think there really is this deep Kantian care uh, present in the theory. And even if Kant's rhetoric or what he focuses attention on in explaining his theory, if you go and, and read the grounding or the critique of practical reason, even if that isn't getting highlighted as much, when we look at the theory for what it's actually standing for, I really think it is present. Um, just as a little a, a personal anecdote, uh, I went to a conference uh, earlier this year in the fall, the Northwest Philosophy Conference, and there was a, a Kant section. I was commenting on a paper, and and in the in the in the session, a bunch of papers got presented, and we were having kind of a conversation. Same people in the room for all the different uh, talks. Uh, I found about it was probably a room of fifteen philosophers. And three of them were seemingly, uh, as we had more conversations throughout the day and over lunch and stuff, were really involved and invested in this sort of Kantian care project. And it was kind of eye-opening to me because I always thought I was kind of a weirdo on this, but that other people are picking up on this too. Um, <clears throat> if you remember from Friday, when we were cashing out this whole thing of uh, act in a way that you treat all people always at the same time as an end and never simply as a means... Um, this third formulation of the categorical imperative. I was talking about how it involves this judgment that people are ends in and themselves. 
that means they are they have unconditional value and what happens to them always matters it never doesn't matter you can't treat the value of a person or whether you're concerned about them and what's happening for them as a means for something else they have to be respected in and of themselves sometimes Kant has been uh, uh, oh, and, and sorry sorry I'm getting a little ahead of myself um, one way we cashed out what does it mean to actually be invested in the good of people is going to happen in terms of freedom the whole derivation of this third formulation comes from a recognition that we of necessity treat our own reason as uh, authoritative we have respect for our own rational capacity in setting our own ends for ourselves before we even get into like what particular actions we should be willing for ourselves we have that fundamental respect um, <clears throat> this is a part of every judgment of goodness we could ever make even self-interested goodness even things that are otherwise going to turn out to be immoral on Kant's ethics even those mistakes in what we value and the principles or intentions that we give to our own will always have that component when you universalize that then you have to think about how any being with this capacity deserves the same kind of respect that you give to your own rational capacity so caring for people or promoting the good for them means respecting their capacity to be self-determining and we talked about edge cases here of how you might frustrate someone's will but it can only be justified for Kant this can only be justified if it actually promotes their capacity for being self-determining now sometimes this gets interpreted uh, like Kantian ethics is used as a appeal to justify some kind of like libertarian ethic that really focuses on not interfering with other people's lives and their choices and their will like we said though these edge cases make room for something else but I I've always felt and this is a little bit more of like the Tim gloss on Kant kind of thing the interpretation of Kant um, <clears throat> that Kant requires more than just a policy of non-interference but a positive promoting so take take like the capitalist scenario we were talking about on Friday if um, I'm like well I'm not gonna do something with you without your consent so like a consensual agreement like a transaction in some ways that respects this third formulation of the categorical imperative because I'm not coercing you or manipulating you in some inappropriate way but it also could be very um, insensitive to what is good for you right I could be like um, well I know you'll agree to this so I'm here's my proposal right you could have someone over a barrel in that transactional negotiation and yeah you're re you're you're um, requiring their consent that's kind of a very minimal respect for their agency um, but it still is not really acting with them as an end in mind um, it is it is uh, still your your attitude in the transaction the reason why you're acting this way or why you you make a proposal or agree to a proposal is about what you can get out of it and they're just a means for you to acquire what you're looking for and so I don't think that respects the third formulation of the categorical imperative fully we'll see some other theories uh, or comments along the way here that are gonna uh, I think be in line they're they're influenced by Kant and they are sort of saying something similar to the line I'm giving you right now um, so I think for Kant respecting other people as intrinsically value valuable doesn't mean just letting them do what they want and not interfering with them through coercive means but is also a matter of being deeply committed to promoting and empowering their agency um, and so for me when I think about the ideals of feminism about trying to empower women and also the way in which feminism has widened its circle its scope of who it's concerned with to not just include uh, concerns about the oppression of women or the way in which women are disempowered but any group that is sort of disempowered in society I think there's a, actually a way in which they really should be thinking of Kant here as an ally and rather and instead of as an enemy there's there's an article uh, that has been very influential to me about this um, that I got a hold of years ago uh, by a feminist philosopher who is arguing exactly for this at the end of class on on Friday I mentioned how for Kant you can wrong yourself like you can disrespect your own self and this feminist philosopher she was arguing that Kant gives very important theoretical language for modern concerns of feminism 
that see there being this possibility for oppressed peoples to wrong themselves by being complicit in systems that oppress them, um, that take away their dignity and agency and empowerment. Um, and so you could get a nice Kantian argument for that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit more about um, what this sort of formulation seems to require from us. Um, but I want to go a little bit further with this. Um, here, one second. Sorry, I paused the video because I thought there was a hanging thread, and then I, I figured it out. <clears throat> Let's go back to this thing about um, the edge case that we were talking about on Friday with interfering with someone's um, will for the sake of promoting their agency. This, this is a kind of paternalistic scenario. Children are a good example of this. I think we talked about that on Friday. Um, but there's another philosopher um, who I think I might have mentioned when we did the Code of Intellectual Conduct, this Paul Tillich guy, um, existentialist, sort of Lutheran theologian from the uh, 40s, 50s, um, got kicked out of Nazi Germany. He was the guy with the anxieties of non-being, I think I mentioned. He's got a um, an analysis of power, the ethics of power, that really strikes me as uh, very Kantian and kind of giving a, a good, he doesn't talk about Kant directly, but it, it's a good way to understand what Kant is going for here too. Tillich says that the use of power over others is um, sort of, it has an initial moral, it's initially morally problematic, sort of in a prima facie way, at first blush, at, on first appearance, um, without other all other things being equal, um, to use power against people uh, or against their will is not appropriate. <clears throat> there, this isn't the way that we're sub ideally supposed to treat each other. But Tillich makes an exception case for this. Um, he says the reason why use of power against other people is uh, morally problematic <clears throat> is it because it uh, takes away from their ability to be self-determining. So when you... Um, the only possible way in which using power on someone could be morally justified is if it is ultimately in their best interest, not in terms of, of happiness considerations or like, like a parent being like, I'm not going to let you do this because it's for your own good kind of thing, like you don't want to harm yourself or you know, those concerns about consequences like utility stuff, um, but rather in terms of empowering their ability to make decisions for themselves. Um, that's that's the sort of key ingredient for Tillich. Uh, so something like, I think I brought up this example too from Friday, um, if there's any kind of coercive power involved in education, which there is, there's some of that going on, um, like when I create assignments and grading systems and all that kind of, there, there's some power institutions in education for sure. Um, this could be justified on the grounds that it leaves someone after the use of that power in a more empowered state. And, and that's really what I think Kantian cares all about. I've alluded to how for Kant, acting rationally, acting morally, and acting freely are all the same thing. And this is another point at which those, those parallels kind of all come back together. Um, to respect people as being morally valuable, as being proper objects of care and concern, means being treating them as free. Like that's the, the moral regard toward them is about promoting their ability to be free. Again, as we said on Friday, just because it's so important, got to emphasize it. This is in virtue not of the person's um, actual manifested demonstration of their self-determination, because we never do that perfectly, but just that they have the capacity. And freedom for Kant means that you are the author of your actions. You are writing your own programming via reason. Reason is the thing that allows us to do this. We set these principles for ourselves instead of acting on inclinations. So in many ways, letting people do what they want, letting them act on their desires, is actually not caring for them. Um, I, I don't know if I brought up this example, so I might be repeating myself, but it, it, it's, a, it's a really good one, I think, for illustrating this idea. Um, imagine you're a friend. You, you have a friend. <laughs> I hope that's not hard. Um, like, this is someone you actually really deeply care about. And let's say you become aware of some concern about how they're living, something that seems like a destructive practice or the, uh, some way they disrespect themselves, something like this. If you're going to take this stance that says, oh, well, who am I to tell them what they should be doing with their life? 
And so I'm not going to like rebuke them. I'm not going to offer this sort of criticism of their actions. That seems really uncaring. Like you're not actually committed to what is good for them. You have a kind of Kantian obligation on this third formulation of the categorical imperative to present them with the concern. Um, you might be wrong. You might be wrong about what's actually good for them, but this action is the way to demonstrate care. Now, th this is where we get into another very, very, very important idea that's going to be crucial for the next formulation, the fourth formulation of the categorical imperative, this kingdom of ends thing. When you make that kind of rebuke to them, you are not interfering with their will. If you gave this rebuke in a coercive way, where you're like, we're not going to be friends anymore if you don't respect, if you don't shape up or something like that. Now you're twisting their arm. Now you're manipulating them. You're basically needling their inclinations and their desires to try to manipulate them into doing something. And that's not respecting them as the kind of being that can exist as an end to themselves, that can self-legislate their own conduct, right? If you, if you do it that way, if you try to use the carrot or the stick to manipulate their behavior, that isn't Kantian respect. That's not respecting their Kantian dignity. But when you give them a concern, you're not doing this. There, there, there's plenty of ways in which you are not, you don't have to be engaging in that bullshit coercive sort of thing. All you're doing is giving them more ideas for consideration. And more ideas for consideration empowers agency. It empowers reason. It helps them explore the sorts of thinking that they would have to be doing in order to be uh, self-legislating, to like consider what are all the options, to help them um, consider the like universalization sort of moral reflection that Kant's talking about in the first two formulations of the categorical imperative. For Kant, uh, rational discourse itself, like rational debate, is a deep opportunity for care, for co this Kantian care, uh, a way in which we can help each other be self-determining agents, help us consider all the things that matter. Very, very similar to the sort of um, maybe vision that you got from the Code of Intellectual Conduct when we were reviewing that, this cooperative truth-seeking thing, where even if we disagree, and maybe one of us is right, maybe one of us is wrong, maybe we're both wrong. The, the action of engaging in that space with another person can be this deep expression of respect. This is important because when we now want to move from individual morality to social justice, um, and how should we interact? What are the just ways for us to interact with each other in society? How, how should our relationships be looking? Um, this is going to be the core idea for Kant. Um, this way in which we uh, share in the, our ability to access this rational space of considerations for action and what would be the justification for things in a way that's, um, in, in some ways the word is apt to say impersonal, right, from this universal perspective. Um, like we're all working on this sort of thing together. Um, while we all have our own subjective idiosyncrasies and unique experiences, um, all of those get brought to the table of considering overall what does it make sense for us to do? What are the kinds of uh, universal rules for conduct that can be universalized without exception cases, without counterexamples, without hypocrisy and double standards? That's really important. Um, there, another misconception that often happens with Kant, I just want to take a little time out here to address it, is that these impersonal appeals, this is, this is part of the, actually the, the weight of the feminist critique of Kant, um, and there, there's a point that they have to make for this. Um, these impersonal appeals don't necessarily require that we have to ignore all the things that make us contingently different. Um, I think that's a that's a common misconception here. Like we ignore all the contingencies, as we talked about last week. You can universalize maxims that talk about contingent goodness, and in fact, we're going to have to do that if we're going to have any moral system that really can be universalized. We can't just throw everyone into a ham-fisted, one-size-fits-all box and think that morality is going to be done here. Um, the way in which these universal principles, like the respect for the dignity of people, 
is going to inform our particular actions with them in the scenarios in which we find ourselves it's going to have to be sensitive to those subjective details um, it's just that those subjective details don't tell you all by themselves how they ought to be treated they have to be put into the context of everything else so um, we're not going to be glossing over those things that are different about us um, including the things that we judge to be the correct rules for conduct uh, it's just those things aren't going to be automatically authoritative they they only get their authority once they're sort of run through this gauntlet of universalizing conditions so um, I want to go back to a scenario here that is very very salient for considerations of social justice and Kantian social justice uh, and that's the, the example we talked about with the person who's thinking about not helping the person who's experiencing homelessness like someone's in need you're in a position to help but maybe you don't have to help them but when we really look at that maxim that particular maxim for conduct we find it can't be universalizable why well because we have to consider agreeing with that principle or legislating that principle as a universal rule for conduct and we can't seem to do that under all possible circumstances we could find ourselves in remember the prince and the pauper sort of framing that i gave to it so what does that mean well i don't ignore all the differences that exist between people but i take into account the particularities of those circumstances and what would make rational sense for for someone in that situation like is there a rule that would make sense given everybody how, how can we coordinate all of our actions together um, and it might include that if you're in a position to help and someone's in need of help you should offer that help and there might also be some maxims here about when and where you should be accepting help from other people too that we can we could maybe find a pattern here for when that is morally appropriate and when it's not morally appropriate um, now that's a tricky project and I think uh, with Kant's emphasis on what's universal and necessary here you might still be left with a lot of questions about what that should look like and I don't think Kant's theory answers all those questions as I've been trying to emphasize along the way here Kant's theory is just a foundation but it gives us a guiding light to be shooting for we we have this standard from the first two formulations of the categorical imperative that whatever is going to be the right answer to that question which could be a really sticky thing to sort out it's got to be something that doesn't have these double standards to it that the basis on which we'd agree to the rule can't be on something contingent like private interest or that it works for my circumstances but it wouldn't work for somebody else's circumstances um, if the only reason I'd agree with this universal principle is because it works for me then that's not good enough kind of like our little discussion of democracy that when we're having debates in a democracy about how society should be set up I can't just be thinking about the rules that I'd agree to given my personal circumstances but I gotta think about what what's the way to coordinate all together so now we're getting to the really really key idea for understanding Kant and social justice which actually I'm a I'm personal um, confession here I sort of knew this but it wasn't until I started teaching this class that it this thought about Kant and how to interpret him like locked into place and I'm like how did it take me so many years to figure this out um, I was kind of dancing around it in my head I think intuitively I picked it on picked it up but now that I'm teaching a class that's just about political philosophy and putting that lens on it it like clicked right into place and it's this idea it's a really important idea for Kant there is no difference between personal justice or how justice informs my actions as an individual and social justice they're exactly the same thing because if my actions as an individual are going to be morally justified if the rules or maxims I want to give myself to act on are morally justified they have to be justified on grounds that apply to everybody under all possible circumstances so the only rules that I can appropriately act on for my actions to have moral worth have to be those that would also make sense when we're thinking about ourselves as an existing community of diverse experiences and diverse circumstances I, I love that I've got this patch this infinite diversity and infinite combinations this Vulcan uh, philosophy from Star Trek totally relevant here um, 
that there are all of these diversities, but there's a pattern um, that locks them all together, that integrates them together. That's the Kantian vision here. So when we start wondering what should be the principles that govern how we interact with each other at the societal level, for Kant, there's no difference between the kind of moral reasoning and reflection you have to do to critically think about that question and the kind of moral reflection and critical reasoning you have to do about deciding about your actions as an individual what you're going to stand for individually and what you'd stand for when it comes to the collective group are going to perfectly match up. There's not going to be any disconnect between those two things. Um, and this doesn't mean things like um, we all need to be exactly the same or something like that. Uh, we don't have to like all the same things. We don't have to get our happiness from all the same places. But whatever are the regulative principles for justice, what divides the line between actions that are permissible versus impermissible? That's something we need to be all on the same page about. So take, for instance, like, um, I, don't, I don't know, I, I've got all these board games here. You can see part of my, my crazy board game collection here. There's a lot of board games out there, and different people like different things. And when we're, we have a board game night, and we're trying to decide what game to play, there's lots of different preferences and whether you like one game or another, that's fine. Like, when, there's nothing real big about, uh, like, big issues of justice about how you want to get entertainment value, right? Uh, on the face of it, that might, it might look like that. Um, and there's room for that. There's room for, you can like this or like that. All those choices are permissible. But there might be still some universal principles that are like some red lines that shouldn't be crossed. Like, um, this has been a debate in the board game community for a long time, especially the wargaming community, the historical wargaming, which I, I'm a big fan of history. I've loved historical wargames since high school. Um, they're really fascinating. You can learn a lot by playing board games about historical things. But a lot of them are about war and uh, about some of these like really nasty parts of human history. There's a war game convention that actually happens right in my old backyard here in Issaquah every year. And there's a history professor who uh, usually comes from Arizona, and I've had w many wonderful late night chats with him at this board game convention. We've talked about this issue where there's a concern about um, romanticizing uh, or enjoying uh, and taking entertainment value out of historical events that are really kind of, it gets kind of morally icky. Um, whether that's uh, a sort of lionization of certain um, uh, Nazi generals, like, say, uh, Rommel's a really good example. Uh, historical wargaming culture has oftentimes looked at Rommel as this, like, virtuous general, even though he's a Nazi general. It's like, is that cool? And maybe a board game is sort of reinforcing that. Um, or uh, um, treating... Um, matters of, say, colonialization and the subjugation of other peoples, the oppression of them, as just another game mechanism without any kind of commentary or awareness about the moral issues that that connect with that. There's a concern here that it could uh, undermine our sense of virtue by not treating this as a weighty issue that it actually is. Now that starts to get problematic. Now it's not just a matter of, like, whatever floats your boat. Maybe there's some preferences or ways of gaining entertainment that are not cool. Sorry for a series of extended examples here, but here's just another one uh, that maybe help, helps to get the point across. Some of my colleagues in grad school were working on a project, uh, a big ethics project, trying to evaluate Second Life. Maybe you've heard of Second Life. It's like an online uh, role-playing kind of massive multiplayer game, but it's not like World of Warcraft or something like that. Uh, it's just basically playing pretend. Like, people get to have a world, and they interact with people in these environments, and can do role-playing. And there's a subculture in uh, Second Life that's all about pedophilic fantasies. So these are consenting adults, they're not children, but they're role-playing, like, sexual encounters uh, that are pedophilic. Okay? Now, no one's getting hurt. Not in a not in the direct way that we think about when we have concerns about pedophilia. That, you know, children being abused, this kind of thing. But their whole project was trying to figure out like 
is this morally permissible? Is it okay for consenting adults to engage in this kind of form of entertainment um, or, or pleasure, right, through uh, playing out these fantasies? There's a lot of wrinkles about that. And um, I'm not going to try to resolve that whole debate right now. But the whole point is you can see that there's something at least potentially morally problematic about this. So there might be some lines here about things that are impermissible, even if there's other space here that's permissible. And whatever those lines are, they need to be universal. So this emphasis on universality in Kant and what justice looks like can't be uh, just reduced to something like, we all need to be exactly the same or something like that. The concerns about uh, stormtrooper societies or something like that. This, this kind of dystopian future is not something that's being promoted by Kant. Uh, while, still, while we can still say here that um, there, the, whatever social justice looks like is something that applies to the individual and to the society with no real disconnect between that. That that's the big idea I was gunning for in this whole section, right? That for Kant, um, what individual justice looks like, my own behaviors, and what institutional justice looks like are exactly the same. Okay, so that's a that's a little foreshadowing. We haven't talked about the details here, so maybe it's about time we get into the formula of autonomy itself. So here's here's Kant's fourth formulation of the categorical imperative. Again, it derives from this, a universalizing this principle for individual action about or interpersonal justice. Uh, actually, this is, oh, sorry, there's so many things that are important to, that I could give you to help understand what's going on. All right, here's just a really quick recap. First two formulations of the categorical imperative are all about how can I act morally in as an individual? And I'm confronted with how Anytime I'm going to will anything at all, if I'm going to do any, pursue any good, set any end or purpose for my own action, that I'm held by a rule that I give to myself, that is the law of non-contradiction. For me to be able to act, and I'm the one who's acting. Reason is the one that's fully determining the end. Reason plays by the rules of logic, so it can't legislate principles for its own conduct that contradict itself. Okay, so that's that's on me, just how do I act in a self-determined way? If I don't act on maxims that are universally or universalizable without contradiction, now I'm contradicting my own will. Okay? At least and imagined in this counterfactual way, if I was in these different circumstances, I wouldn't will this based on my pattern of reasoning. Right? I need to have a pattern of reasoning that I could subscribe to under all possible circumstances. So then, when we uh, go to this formula of the end in itself, now we're applying that same principle in an interpersonal interaction. So how do my actions then get, how do we evaluate them in the context of me interacting with other people? That I have to respect them as intrinsically valuable self-determining agents, just the same way that I give this respect to myself of necessity from the first two formulations. Then in the third one, it's kind of, so it's about us, okay? So the first two are about the I, me. Um, the second one is about I and thou, to make a reference to some stuff we're going to be tangentially touching on the next week. Me and you, like this, you know, you and me sort of thing, like uh, two agents that then are interacting with each other. What's my attitude about you, right? What's my moral attitude about you? This fourth one is about in us, like a system of social organization and cooperation, which is what societies are. They're systems of cooperation. Even when they are oppressive, there's a way in which we're all kind of playing by a system of oppression. The oppressors and the oppressed are playing by the same rules, so to speak. Um, otherwise, you don't have a system of oppression, right? They're... They're these institutional rules that then create this kind of result. That's why, the go back a little ways here, it's possible for someone who is oppressed to like be complicit in their own oppression right, by playing into that system instead of resisting it. And they oftentimes do resist it, and I want to gloss over that point. Um, okay, but in this third way, 
we're thinking about the principles about how we organize together those institutional things that aren't just about me treating you in a relate in an individual relationship here but this n network this web of interactions that are mediated by institutions so what should we do with that okay so here's the principle the categorical imperative in the context or the framing of an us or a we says act on maxims you can will as laws mandated by a kingdom of ends where you are included now to make sense of this principle we need to talk about what a kingdom of ends is so as i say in my lecture notes here a kingdom of ends could be anything like a club is a really good idea like the board game convention that i go to that's a kingdom of ends people there's no like big institutional structure here it's just some guys who are like hey, uh, we want to have this event happen where we all get to do this thing that we like. We all like board games, specifically war games, so it's even more narrowly defined. Um, and let's organize and all chip in money and rent out this hotel space, this conference space, so we can do this together. So all the people involved, uh, through their own wills, decide to collectively work together to a common end that is shared by everyone individually okay that's a kingdom of ends um, now that's a very contingent one and you can imagine just like I can have contingent ends I set for myself through maxims that don't pass the universalizability test we can still do this in whatever we are using to put ourselves together just think like tribalistic life right uh, the concerns about tribalism uh, that we sometimes talk about are where there are special interest groups that have a kingdom of ends within themselves but doesn't necessarily include other people right and they fight against other special interest groups who have different competing ends okay so then uh, this is very relevant for the political uh, realism topic we're gonna have next week um, that maybe internally to a domestic uh, society they're sort of all on the same page all under one law or or state or government but then the international relations between those states are not on the same page they don't have shared interests and so they conflict okay so a kingdom of ends is just any scenario in which there is some end which all the people in the kingdom in that society in that community they're all on the same page the way that they will individually uh, converges with everyone else and how they're contributing in their individual wills what Kant's imagining here in this fourth formulation is a kind of society in which the basis of our shared kingdom of ends are, is based on the categorical imperative the moral law what if we all share this and to a certain extent Kant thinks we do going back to the first couple formulations whenever we will we subject our own will to this law of the principle of non-contradiction and then the other things that follow from that like respect for persons right respecting people as intrinsically valuable that's something we can't help but will and if we we choose actions that violate that we're just going against the rule that we set for ourselves we're contradicting ourselves and that is the basis on which we could detect it as an immoral act so if we all have this built in or sort of baked in to the constitutive nature of having a rational will at all being just having the capacity to set rules for our own conduct then there's a basis here of kind of a common ground there's there's some there's some way in which we are all on the same page we don't execute on that perfectly because our wills are not perfectly governed by reason inclinations distract our will they co-opt that rational process bias is, that's the whole bias thing and as, as a Kantian would understand it and that means we don't get on the same page but it's not um, the way in which we're not on the same page is not um, based on anything that is essential to our rational nature that's a that's a really really key idea to this okay um, so uh, what would it look like if we really did this if we have inside of ourselves as individuals the secret of the moral law universalizing our maxims without contradiction 
respecting all people as ends in themselves as intrinsically valuable, never to treat them as a means solely for uh, other ends. Now we could use that as a basis for how we coordinate our actions together. In other words, Kant's kind of optimistic here. From an objective standpoint, there is no need for fundamental conflict. There is no way in which people are essentially divided against each other. If we're divided, if we act against each other's wills, this is a reflection of contingency, not of necessity, not a kind of like hopelessness to conflict. Um, there, there's kind of an, on a, an objective way of looking at it, there's no reason for us to be fighting. Sometimes you hear people, you know, like the hippie movement of the 20th century is like, peace, man, like, why are we all fighting and killing each other? It makes no sense. Kant would be like, yep, that's right. And it's not just some hippy-dippy sentimentality or something. It's not based on our sentiments. It's based on reason, on the basic way in which we we have this ability to have independent wills, to, to be self-determining. That's a pretty big idea. I mean, if that's true, that's amazing. If the... Uh, and this kind of gets at a theme that's present through all four formulations of the categorical imperative. Um, there's uh, there's a way in which this idea that acting freely, acting morally, and acting rationally are all exactly the same thing. The only way in which we act immorally with each other is because we're not acting rationally. That it, This has been a dream for many moral philosophers over the centuries. Um, if you wanted to, uh, so l take a little, I'm going to take a little tangent here, but I, I promise it's worth it. I hope it's, I hope it's useful to you in understanding this. If someone acts immorally or unjustly, but, and we're not defining exactly what that looks like here for this thought experiment, let's say someone's, someone's just like, I don't care about morality. You'd want to be able to criticize them. You want to be able to say, you're making a mistake here. If you're not acting morally, you're making some kind of mistake. But how do you justify the mistake? It's very hard to do this without getting into question-begging territory, without just presupposing whatever are the moral values you think are correct. It would be really nice if you could say, well, the mistake is a rational mistake. It just has to do with being rational. It doesn't have to do with you sharing my values or my feelings or my life experience or any of these other contingent things. It's just a matter of logic. Kant provides a theory that could maybe fulfill that dream to be able to say you don't have to like people you don't have to have this experience of life where you feel deep empathy and compassion for your fellow human being or something like that it's just a matter of logic you're just making an error like a mathematical error um, that's pretty cool because it doesn't disenfranchise anyone or anyone's life experience it's not question begging it's not presupposing what you're trying to prove that's a real big, big upshot of Kant's ethics if he's able to pull this off. If this whole derivation of the categorical imperatives uh, withstands philosophical scrutiny. And there is scrutiny for it. Um, but this is, this is a kind of dream, a dream scenario, to be able to have an argument for why if you disrespect other people or you're not concerned about them, if you don't have this kind of Kantian care or respect for the dignity of others, if you are not invested in empowering them to be independent uh, people, then you're making a logical error. Um, but it also gives us a positive, so it's not just about being able to reject immorality or to criticize it, to have a basis or a platform from which to launch that criticism, but it's also about presenting a positive vision here too. That's going to get to the next idea. I really wish I was with you in person or talking all this. I mean, this this lecture video is our, our best mechanism at this point, but I'm, I'm sure there's lots of questions and things, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about this on Monday and seeing how much of this is making sense. Um, but I'm going to try to give you all these different ways of explaining the idea, different angles to approach it in the hopes that something uh, helps click here. All right, so on this formula of autonomy... Um, it's, it's, this is the one that I think is very much a restatement of the other ones. It's not really adding anything too substantively different, as evidenced by my statement that for Kant, social justice and individual justice are perfectly identical. But it helps you think maybe, it, it's like another heuristic, another way to get your imagination going in the direction that 
this kind of uh, moral reasoning, a Kantian moral reasoning is, is, is working, that I need to think about if we were all going to get together and get on the same page and design rules for society that really are informed by the third formulation of categorical imperative, what would that look like? What could we all agree to? The, the most natural way for this to go is some discussion of human rights. And that's why I've been saying over the weeks that uh, Kantian ethics is sort of the premier moral theory to give an underlying justification or foundation for why human rights matter, like fundamental human rights would be the right way to go about moral reasoning. So sometimes there, I've seen critics of human rights ethics saying like, why do people deserve all these things? Um, why, why should we have, like, do people really deserve it? Maybe a person's, uh, like, um, or I don't know, what's the phrase I usually get from people on this? Um, like, these privileges have to be earned rather than given. That, that's a line I hear a lot from critics of, of human rights stuff. That it's kind of like entitlement, right? That... I have this basic dignity that all the rest of society needs to respect me as a person. It's like the world just doesn't work that way. Well, for a Kantian, maybe the world doesn't work that way, but logic works this way. Reason works this way. If you're going to have a rational society, it has to work this way. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about rights. Rights and obligations are two sides of the same coin. So take, for example, a, a real classic here, uh, the right to life. Really, if you're, you're going to start to make a list of fundamental human rights, it seems like the right to exist. <laughs> right? Um, and the, it, uh, when someone murders another person, they're violating their right to life. So if you have a right to exist, then everyone else has an obligation to not kill you effectively. So if we get from the third formulation to categorical imperative, this obligation about how we're supposed to treat each other, to respect each other's dignity as a self-determining agent, and to promote that ability to be empowered and self-determining. Now that in that those the negative actions that are being disallowed by that principle, that you have obligations to not do those things and to do these other things, carves out a space for rights. And a lot of uh, human rights that get articulated, like these lists of human rights, have a lot to do about respecting people's dignity and their ability to be self-determining agents. Um, that's, that's a lot of the content of them. We'll look at this a little bit later. Uh, I've got a reading that I, or a theory I want to show you from uh, Sen and Nussbaum, who are kind of modern Kantians or neo-Kantians, Kantian-ish. They, uh, they put together a, a theory of human rights for the UN, which actually the UN is going to be relevant here in this lecture in a second. Um, and uh, you see a lot of those values sort of reflected. So if, if we have these obligations to people individually, we can start creating a code of how institutions should be judged about whether the rules that they're setting up really respect human rights or violate those human rights as a standard for the moral legitimacy of those systems of society. Okay? And that's really where this kingdom of ends thing that Kant is going for comes from. But there's something else that you might be thinking about, uh, about any kind of legislation of human rights. It puts restrictions on people's actions. And there's been a lot of hand wringing over the centuries about the legitimacy of a state in particular to use coercive force or power over citizens to con to basically force them to conform to principles. This gets to some of the power things we've already been talking about. Um, but if that system... Oh, okay, so the concern here would be that the state is now infringing on people's liberty, their ability to be self-determining, by sort of mandating and putting the threat of punishment up there for how they have to conform to those rules. And for Kant, that's a concern. Um, one, one tangent I can go on here with explaining Kantian ethics that I'm, I'm not going to go too deep on, but let me know if you want to talk about it. Kant was really opposed to any uh, moral system that sets the moral law, or what is ultimately right and wrong, these objective moral truths, in some place that's not subjective, that's like external. 
A really classic example of this, and some of you I know are in the class are religious, so you might find this interesting, is something called divine command theory, which basically says God's uh, commands determine what is morally right and wrong. Okay, By just God commanding it, it makes it so. So it's saying morality is a matter of someone say so, but not any human say so, God say so. I mean, the, an equivalent, a human equivalent, would be something like Hobbes's Leviathan, of the absolute monarch who their say-so makes it so for the society. And we can have concerns about that, like, who, who has the authority to do this, right? How could any human give, be given this power to determine what's morally right and wrong? And then you might say, well, God's on a different level, you know? But Kant's like, no, nah, I'm still worried about that, too. That any kind of extrinsic outside of your own will that is the sort of basis for the moral law ends up being uh, puts you in a position of coercion and where your relationship to morality is really just a choice of do I obey someone else's will or my own and that's where you get problems of moral motivation someone's like well like your parents are telling you what to do the government's telling you what to do religion aka God is telling you what to do am I gonna be down with that or am I not gonna follow my own path well Kant's saying you don't have to worry about that moral motivation problem if the authority of the moral law comes from yourself and here the concern would be relativism right oh if it's gonna be subjective is it gonna be relativistic and just anyone decides what they're gonna do for themselves and Kant's like no because the moral law that comes from yourself is about something that's necessary and universal and not about your contingent inclinations or desires or preferences or something like that. It's not like anything you decide will be moral. It has to be subject to this moral law that's universal that makes it possible for you to will anything of anything as being good. Okay, That's really interesting. Um, more following morality is really just a matter of obeying your own commands that you of necessity give to yourself it's not about obeying some external authority at all so Kant is against divine command theory he's also deeply religious which is really interesting in other words you can ha you can be religious and believe in morality and even I think Kant does believe that his religious you know background does inform morality although he doesn't bring that into any of his arguments here without having to subscribe to divine command theory uh, there's a big cool tangent there if you want to talk about theology and morality with me outside of class happy to do that uh, that might be a fun conversation but I'm not going to pursue it further here um, but this is evidence of how for Kant obeying even the principles uh, or the laws of a state or institutions from society uh, can't be some sort of game of me just bending my will to some external will. Anyone say so. Okay? It can't be about that. It's got to require my free participation. It, in other words, following morality is actually the penultimate expression of my ability to be self-determining not as something that cuts against it. This is a big point of emphasis for me because I find uh, with a lot of humans that I have had the the privilege of being able to encounter and to understand their minds and hear what they think and feel, I've seen this as a major reason why sometimes people are somewhat allergic to talk of moral duty or obligation, um, almost like morality is an object of resentment um, because it seems like it's interfering with your will. And if Kant's right, that's a real mistake. It's almost a category mistake to think that that's true. Um, that actually morality doesn't interfere with your freedom. It presupposes your freedom and is the full expression of your freedom. Freedom, personal liberty, and constraining your actions with the moral will are not against each other. They are perfectly aligned. That's, that's, really, that's a real big compelling thought. Um, that it actually is empowering rather than disempowering to respect things like human rights. Okay, so for this kingdom of ends for Kant, what would this actually look like? What would Kant's utopian just society look like? It's a world, as Kant puts it in, an, in another piece of writing, it's a world in which there is no monarch. There is no king. There is no coercive government. It's kind of anarchy. There's no need for government.
because, as Kant puts it, everyone is the king. Everyone is the monarch. When they legislate a rule, when their reason legislates a rule to themselves for their own proper conduct, and this passes all the tests of the categorical imperative, they are at the same time willing a universal rule for everybody. And for a kingdom of ends in which everyone has this as their the end on which they converge, respecting the categorical imperative, then we are all going to, of in a natural way, do what is right without any need for coercion. Uh, Locke is, John Locke is a philosopher we're going to be studying here soon, um, who's in this liberal tradition, enlightenment period that Kant comes from too. And I, I've mentioned this quote, I think, before in class. Um, but it, it, he said, Locke says, uh, people in a democracy get the government they deserve. It's sort of like, the, and what he's meaning to suggest is that in as much as people don't act rationally in choosing their leaders, they get leaders that sort of reflect that. Or it's like uh, the extent to which people are irres. Here's another. This is a you can't. This is why we can't have nice things kind of idea. Um, the extent to which people cannot be self-governing and hold their own will accountable to the moral law necessitates a government with coercive power that's going to force them to do so. Um, but the extent to which we can be self-governing and self-accountable and self-responsible, then you don't have a need for that. You don't need to have a coercive government or state or or even if you're not talking about a government or a state, but just a, a culture, right? A social institution which is encouraging and coercing conformity. That's not necessary if everyone's just able to be self-governing. So the, the best example of a, a, an ideal socially just society for Kant is the UN, the United Nations which actually has a historical basis. Kant wrote an essay called Perpetual Peace, in which um, he outlines what this kind of just society would look like, uh, in which there's, there's no endless conflict, kind of some warfare, stuff like that going on. And the argument is basically that the only way to achieve perpetual peace is for everybody to, of their own will, follow the moral law. To choose it for themselves, rather than to be like deferring to or relying on other mechanisms of coercion to be doing the right thing. Like people don't have to be bribed or threatened to do what is right, but instead they choose to do it for themselves. And the, this essay, Perpetual Peace, became the uh, blueprint for the League of Nations, which was uh, an institution, an international institution. That was founded after World War I. Some of the readings we got this week, um, the uh, political realism essay is going to talk about that, um, about the League of Nations and some of the history behind this. Uh, but the idea was that let's actually do this, right? We just went through, like the people in this time are like, we just went through World War I, which was just like a shocking reminder of how far humanity's moral development went. I mean, yeah, let me let me take a little time here to paint the historical narrative because I think it's it's uh, insightful. Uh, it, it, there's some lessons to be learned here. So, in the early modern period that Kant's writing in, and that all these liberal philosophies we're going to be looking at are, are coming out of, uh, it's called the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, because people start getting really enthusiastic about how. The problems that we face in in, in the world uh, are all solvable. Like there's there's nothing stopping us from doing it. We're just too shitty to do it. <laughs> um, there's, so there's all this optimism and enthusiasm for doing it right, and that reason can be the guide for how we can kind of all get on the same page about justice and all this stuff. And and re remember, part of the story of this class's curriculum is going to be that maybe this is not as easy as the Enlightenment thinkers thought. Like there's there's kind of all these problematizations about this and does reason really have this power to resolve all of our moral disagreements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at that time period, there's all this enthusiasm and optimism. And people really thought of themselves a lot of a lot of the thinkers of this time and, and even just people living in society who aren't necessarily the philosophers, right, uh, seeing all these movements happen, uh, slavery becomes illegal across the entire planet. It still happens, but it's no longer state-sponsored in the same sort of way. Um, uh, this, has been a, a, this is a fight that's going on in the 19th century, and 
there actually are some major victories on. Um, slavery actually does finally become illegal. Uh, there's all this attention on women's rights and giving women the power to vote and democracy is spreading and and people are just like this is we're, we're out of the dark ages. We're no longer in barbarism or the it, if we are the extent to which we're still in barbarism, we're moving out of it right things are things are in motion. Humanity is evolving and becoming, um, engaging in this kind of moral progress that's turning into something different. And then it all comes crashing down. Like World War I is this massive wake-up call that the nations of the world and the colonialism that they're engaging in, and for all their high-minded idealism, there still is all of those seeds of human barbarism that are still present in this enlightened you know, new modern society that's happening. And I think World War One was like a wake-up call. It was like those seeds that had not been uprooted, that had not been dealt with, germinated into full full fruit. I mean, there's so much of uh, World War One history that's fascinating. Uh, it really feels in, in some ways like like the the nations of Europe are like children who don't realize what they're doing. Like kids on the play, on the playground like hurting each other in this kind of insensitive way that they don't then then suddenly it's like it gets all too real and there's all of this trauma and atrocity and and abuse and it's just it turns into a nightmare and after that um the league of nations is like we need to find some way to stop this from happening and the things that were the, sort of diagnosed as part of the problems uh that led to world war one include things like there's all this international um, uh, like competition that's taking place. All the individual states are like working under their own self-interest and fighting for their own like legitimacy and power. Um, kind of the way in which they all have these colonialist roots, they all start enacting against each other, <laughs> right? In World War One, conquest and and all this, right? And and they saw that the the uh, the the impetus that led to then this acceleration or um, escalation of conflict came from how people are not on the same page and the idea of the league of nations is like well let's create a forum an international forum where we can all get on the same page there's a lot of skepticism about it even from its very foundings you'll see this in the political realism article that the united states never joins it um, which you would think would be like a major important player in that in that game for it to be legitimate and it, it all eventually comes crashing down, and the League of Nations becomes a failure. Uh, it fails to be able to uh, provide this sort of mediation that prevents future conflict, and you get World War II. And then after World War II, you get the United Nations. And the United Nations is another institution that's modeled after Kant's original vision in perpetual peace. It's, it's sort of reflecting on the failures of the League of Nations and trying to improve upon it. And I would say it has you know, from my opinion, the United Nations has not succeeded in all the ways that you would hope. Uh, it isn't as robust as intended on paper. But part of that is actually, the reasons for its failure are, one, not surprising, and two, uh, actually a reflection of its success. It's successful in one primary way. Both the League of Nations and the United Nations both do exactly what Kant is asking for in this whole formula of the Kingdom of Ends. That it is a international institution. It, it is a uh, social institution, right? It's a kind of a community that's premised not on coercive force, um, but on freedom. Both the League of Nations and the United Nations as international globalist communities do not require uh, anyone to participate. It's a complete. It's a. It's a. It's a community that is completely at will. That is. It only works if everyone agrees that it works. Um, and this is. I don't know how how closely you've tracked the UN or know how it works or any of this sort of stuff. But the UN. Um, it seems powerless. It has no teeth. Right. It. People pass resolutions all the time in the United Nations, and then people just ignore them. 
You know, if countries disagree, they oftentimes just say, yeah, whatever. The United States does this constantly. I mean, it's like the UN was like, the war in Iraq, not justified. The U.S. is like, we don't care, we're doing this anyway. So it, it only works if everyone agrees for it to work. Um, and so for that reason, it's weak and powerless and doesn't get a lot of shit done. But at least it hasn't uh, abandoned this central moral principle that says, if we're going to do this together, it has to be done because we're actually doing it together. Do you remember that principle I gave you with the Code of Intellectual Conduct? The you can't say yes if you can't say no? This, this idea of like genuine consensus? That's what Kant's looking for for social justice. That's the only way you're going to have a, a truly ideal, utopian, socially just society, according to Kant, is that everyone agrees to this. And I think this is a good idea for us to have on our radar going into the political realism discussion that we're going to do next week, because it's easy to be pretty cynical about that, or to be like, yeah, that's why utopias can't exist. <laughs> right? It kind of like says, yeah, that would be pretty ideal, but it's totally impractical, and there's no way this is going to happen. Because power is just too tempting. Um, if people can do it, uh, then they will do it. No one is going to voluntarily restrain their power for the sake of justice. Maybe. Maybe humans are too weak for that. But the alternative is also going to be problematic too. And, and the political realism debate is going to let us play with this a little bit. I'm very curious to hear what your intuitions and reactions are to this kind of scenario. Um, do you think it's ideal to have a society? Would it, would it really be the best? Like if we could just, if anything, we can just dream, you know, dream whatever you want. What would be the best society to live in? Would it be a society in which there's a state with this absolute power, with the threat of violence? Like one, one way of defining um, what a government is that I've heard is a government, I, I kind of like this definition, of, even though it's a somewhat cynical one. Uh, the definition is, the government is just whoever has the monopoly of violence in an area. So you, in, in America, that'd be the state. Uh, the U.S. government has the army and the military. And the military effectively means they have a monopoly on violence. Like, if the government wanted to, it could just do whatever we want. All the gun advocate, gun right activ activist people who say, like, we need to have guns in order to protect our civil liberties against an oppressive state. I'm like, yeah, maybe we could have a debate about that. But in terms of real practical necessity here, I mean, if the United States government wanted to just oppress the hell out of everyone in America, they could do it. I mean, they definitely have the big guns. Like, maybe you've got a shotgun in your house, but They've got helicopters, right? You know, they have 50-pound uh, ballistic missiles and shit. You know, it's just like um, there's, there's, no, there's no way the American people would be able to fight against the, the American military if the government really wanted to get oppressive on us. So they definitely own the monopoly on violence. You can have sporadic cases of terrorism or individual domestic violence or, you know, people killing each other on the street. That can happen. But but really, um, the government is the one that has the control. I, I kind of like this definition because it allows you to understand uh, the kind of function a government performs, even in cases where it doesn't seem like that's happening. So take an example of a scenario where the government, there is no government. Uh, and it's just gangs or warlords or something like that. The reason they have the structuring power in determining what's, what the social institutions look like is that they got monopoly on violence. So you could so going back to the original question, though, that was a little tangent. Um, if you want to imagine what would be the ideal society to live in, do you want to live in a society where uh, social order is premised on a monopoly on violence or coercive power? Or would you want to live in a community or society that's premised on this ideal of everyone being in true consensus with one another, um, that's premised on people's freedom to, to choose to engage and participate? Um, and, and that's where we can go back to, I, I mean, personally, I'm, on, I'm for the second rather than the first, and I think in small communities you see this. Um, when you've got, a, when you, when you do, take friends, right, the family you choose, the close friends that you have. Um, are those relationships and those communities 
uh, premised on someone leveraging power over everybody else? Or if that happened, would you think that's ideal? Is that the kind of community you want to be a part of? You maybe would hope for something better, like genuine invest investment that people have in the good of each other and respecting that and being a part of that. That's Kant's dream for social justice. That's Kantian care in its social expression. Um, it's not um, it's not universal concern under an authoritarian regime that forces you to care about other people. It's happening out of a, a recognition from yourself that this is what's morally right to do. Maybe a society like that's possible. Maybe it's not. We can have a debate about that. But it's also a separate question about just is that the ideal and that we should be aiming to create as much of that as we can while still maybe having some coercive force to deal with the practical uh, realities that we're not perfect moral agents and we're, we haven't yet uh, achieved that kind of moral maturity or moral evolution as a species. Um, this, this goes back though to, uh, to tie another thread all together with this. We get uh, this ideal of uh, inter, uh, uh, interpersonal discourse, rational discourse and debate as sort of a paradigmatic example of moral treatment and moral respect of each other in Kant. Because in this society that we imagine uh, this, this socially just Kantian utopia where you don't need coercive force to get people to play ball, uh, it'd be kind of like um, a vision that Plato has. Um, Plato, uh, here's another fun philosophy tangent. Plato famously has the hot take that my profession shouldn't exist. There shouldn't be ethicists, professional ethicists. Because Plato argues it's the responsibility of every person to be the ethical teacher of everybody else that we're all supposed to be helping each other with this. It sh there shouldn't be like authorities like this, uh, or maybe like a, a religious authority, like a pastor or a priest or something like that, who, who is like uh, given the social function of uh, promoting and protecting the virtue of the people that they serve, right? Uh, that this is a responsibility everyone should have. It shouldn't be a specialized profession, much, much less people getting paid for it. That's a view of Plato. That maybe is what, what uh, Kant has in mind here, too, that um, we, it, it, it's through challenging each other's actions and holding each other accountable that we're not interfering with people's will or trying to coerce or, or uh, constrain their, their liberty or something like that, but it's actually a way that we promote each other's liberty. Okay, so... Um, I've talked about a lot of things here. I want to keep going a little bit more, um, but I, I'm hoping that the, I'm doing a lot of like connecting of the dots here and trying to drag all of these threads together because for Kant, so many things converge here. I hope I've been effective at doing that in this lecture so far. But let, let's go for some of the other um, things I was hoping to explain in this space. Um, one, I wanted to, so this is kind of shifting gears now. That's kind of like, this is an end of something. Here, I'm going to pause the video because I'm feeling myself hyperventilating from talking so much. So let me take a little break. And we'll come back and I'll talk about happy. Ooh, getting lightheaded. Hmm. Took some deep breaths, though, and I feel, feel a little better here. I get really excited about this. Um, it's really cool stuff, I think. Okay. So um, I'm going to revisit some of the themes that we were just talking about in a second when we talk about uh, immorality for Kant, uh, how things can go wrong. But before I do that, I just want to emphasize a couple things about how um, pick, uh, what, what's Kant's attitude about happiness, because this is important in, in sort of contrasting it with Mill and utilitarianism, and how uh, another kind of resisting another misconception about Kantian ethics. So Kant here, let me, I've got some lecture notes on this. So, um, remember we said earlier that Kant doesn't want to build his moral theory on the value of happiness. It's not the purpose of morality to make people happy, Kant says. But he does say some other things about happiness, and now we can understand them. He says, to secure one's own happiness is a duty, at least indirectly, it's like a secondary moral duty, for discontent with one's condition, under many pressing cares and amid unsatisfied wants, might easily become a great temptation to transgress one's duties. This is going to be really relevant uh, for talking about the Senna Nussbaum uh, thing when we do that later on this quarter. 
this sort of extension of Kantian ethics that they do with human rights. Um, Kant's sort of saying that, well, if the purpose is to act rationally, like to be a fully self-determining agent under reason, we know that the threat to this is our inclinations, our desires, um, like desire for power. Um, if you're in survival mode, it's very hard to stick to principles of justice. It very, becomes very tempting to uh, mistreat others or to use others as a means when you're trying to, say, promote the welfare of yourself and maybe the people you love and care about, like your family, like stealing the bread to, to feed your family kind of thing. And that seems like it's moral, right? Um, but it also seems to contradict the, uni the categorical imperative and things like that. Kant's saying, yeah, no one should be in this sort of situation. No one should be forced into that. Um, this is a threat to being able to act morally. So we should be promoting our own happiness and the happiness of other people as a way of caring for them to be exhibiting this rational, self-determining freedom thing, right? So happiness is relevant to that. Um, I like to tell this story about my brother when I was growing up. I, I've mentioned him a couple times. I was very cool and calm in my temperament as a child. My brother was really hot and emotional and get angry and stuff. And um, sometimes he'd try to like annoy me and try to piss me off. Like he'd try to trigger me, right? Try to get me to like lose my cool by like poking me or, or like doing things that he knew annoyed me. Um, he was trying to provoke my inclinations to get me to, to not act rationally, right? Um, to not act freely. Uh, that's a kind of thing that we shouldn't be doing to each other. And to recognize that actions where we're insensitive to the concerns of people's welfare and happiness um, and their own survival is really disrespecting, we're, we're putting barriers in their way of being moral agents um, when we should be promoting it. This is part of my, my argument for why Kantian care under the third formulation is going to require more positive duties and not just duties of non-interference. Um, because our own choices have consequences on people's happiness here. But Kant would not want to say here something like, um, again, any promotion of happiness cannot itself violate the categorical imperative or disrespect people or things like that. And then he also has this quote, I ought to endeavor to promote the happiness of others. And this, I don't know if he exactly means this, uh, this I might take some issue, but it, it sort of treat it tongue in cheek a little bit. Not as though its realization were any concern of mine, whether by immediate inclination or by any satisfaction indirectly gained through reason. In other words, I, 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 shouldn't, I should be trying to promote happiness of others, not because it's going to make me feel good or because I want to or even because of empathy but merely because a maxim which excludes it, that's insensitive to people's happiness, cannot be comprehended as a universal law in one and the same volition. In other words, any maxims where I neglect to be concerned about happiness considerations can't be universalized under the categorical imperative and thus can't be a moral action. So even though Kant is saying morality is not the ultimate, or the happiness is not the ultimate goal of morality, he makes some pretty strong statements that you can't ignore happiness as a part of trying to be moral. Very interesting. So this idea of Kant as like not giving a shit about happiness is is really, I think, a misconception about him. Um, so uh, Kant does con is concerned about happiness, um, but instead of putting it on the top, it's like because you care about justice, you have to be concerned about people in sort of consequentialist ways. And that's not violating or his own ethical principles that he's been laying out. It's not conceding the game to utilitarianism or anything like that. Um, but it, it's sort of embracing part of that, but contextualizing it under these principles of justice. Okay. Uh, definitely wanted to say something about that uh, to avoid that kind of misconception. Kant's not insensitive here. The other thing, though, um, that is worth talking about, um, which I don't know if I, I mentioned this yet, I... Uh, you know, part of the hot take of this is that we're concerned about people's happiness on purely rational grounds, not out of empathy. I just said that. And you might be like, whoa, I think empathy is important here. We should be promoting empathy. And Kant's, I, I think, um, on balance, especially looking at some of his later writings that are not part of the grounding which I gave to you, Kant definitely has some good things to say about empathy. He just doesn't want to put all of his eggs in this basket. And probably the best way that you can 
uh, get inside Kant's head here comes from a footnote that he has in the grounding of the metaphysics of morals on the topic of love. Uh, he says, uh, by way of analogy to what he's saying about morality, he's like, it's kind of like what we'd say about love. That to imagine love as just a principle of inclination, like the feelings that you have for someone, this is implausible as an authentic expression of love for another, of genuine care and concern, of valuing another being as a, a thing intrinsically valuable. He says, love can't be coerced. It has to be freely given for it to be real love. And in as much as Kant's telling the story where inclinations, emotions, and feelings are these causal forces that coerce my will in ways that I don't necessarily legislate for myself or approve of, they're part of my psychology, they're parts of laws of nature, not self-determined laws or self, uh, self-generated self laws. Um, that's like me just being a robot. It's like someone, it's, it's more like uh, something Kierkegaard, uh, another philosopher from the 19th century, talks about when he talks about poetic love as opposed to true love or genuine love. In poetic love, the expressions of poetic love are all about like, I can't help but love you. Like, I'm over, overcome with these feelings for the object of my love. Um, and the poet sort of, as Kierkegaard puts it, like, gives up their will to these emotions uh, and then idolizes that as the actual ideal of love when it's not that way. For Kant, love and moral action has to be something that you choose that's uncoerced so and, and if you have a hard time maybe imagining this for you loving another person you're like that's not my vision for love imagine how you'd want another person to love you would you want someone to love you just because they're forced to or because of like the hormones that are running through their brain or something like that wouldn't it be better uh, wouldn't wouldn't you rather think of it as a much more meaningful gift when someone chooses to care about you regardless of how they feel that they say you know how what happens to you you value you you have value you matter more than how I feel about you that seems like a much deeper sort of thing um, or I guess I'm down with Kant here. <laughs> I'm like, this is how I think love works too. Um, that uh, it has to be uncoerced. And and uh, it just as a personal anecdote here, um, where I've seen like the the emotional love stuff. I'm going on a little tangent here, but I can't help it. It's too too rich and interesting philosophically. Tell me if you want to have a debate about this one too. Uh, this is another tangent we could go on. Um, I remember from very early on when I was, you know, in a young adulthood and anticipating having a romantic relationship with another human being sort of hypothetically that there's this um, honeymoon period that happens at the beginning of a relationship where you're infatuated with each other and the feelings, the drugs are so good, you know, it's like, of course I want to, I want to spend all my time with this person. I'm like, this feels so good. It's like drugs, you know, endorphins and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that feels great, you know, this kind of pleasure that you get from that. And it's cool when the other person's feeling the same thing, you know, and the shared feeling of that. Um, but it always ends. You know, the honeymoon phase always ends. Um, you know, I, I, I find this happens in, in every quarter when I'm teaching. Like, early weeks of the quarter, everyone's really excited and it's new and, like, all this stuff going on. And then it starts to get to be hard. The hard work starts kicking in. We're about to head into a hard work period for the rest of the quarter, um, and then some. Some of the uh, the uh, the veneer, you know, the um, of uh, the glossiness and the chrome starts to wear off a little bit, and you may not be feeling it quite the same way. Um, but I would argue that that's when love really starts to blossom. It's like when the rubber meets the road, when the chips are down. When you're in that space where you're like, I'm not feeling it for my partner or for this other person or your friend even, like a friend or family member or something like that, whoever it is that, because you have lots of forms of loving relationships, but there's kind of a common denominator here. When you're no longer feeling it, when you're like, I'm really pissed off at you right now or annoyed by you or frustrated or whatever else, what do you prioritize? Do you choose to act toward them in a way that is reflective of your feelings 
Or do you act in the way that's actually what's good for them or what's good for your relationship? Do you stick around when the going gets rough um, and you're not feeling it? You're like, yeah, as long as I'm feeling it, I, I'll saddle my, my, wagon, my wagon to your horse. But if I'm not, then peace them out. You know, this is, uh, it seems like it's way more meaningful for someone to do something that actually invests in you and what's best for you and what's actually good for you that, that is an action that reflects how that person values you when they're not feeling it. And that's part of Kant's intuitions about morality too. Do you do the right thing? Like what, what shows a deeper commitment to moral principles? When you're doing it, when you're acting morally, as long as it's convenient to you and your feelings, or when you also, when it's inconvenient, when it's not what you want, when you're not feeling it. You know, sometimes we try to encourage moral behavior in each other by manipulating each other's emotions, like trying to elicit compassion feelings for other people. But I think it's a very, I'd argue here, and the hat's fully turned here, speaking kind of, I could speak as a Kantian, but I, I also endorse this, so I'll turn the hat. What it, that might be too narrow a vision of what compassion really is. That compassion isn't just that I happen to have feelings for these people, but that I can value them and care about what happens to them even if I don't have those feelings. That I can recognize their humanity. I can recognize their intrinsic value as a person, even if I don't like them. Even if I don't you know, feel the good, the good drug feelings about them, or, or even the pains of like, they're suffering and I'm suffering too, kind of thing. Um, empathy can be useful as an expedient method of manipulation. But if Kant's dream here of how we ought to act individually for ourselves, how we encourage others to act, and how we coordinate our efforts together is right, then we want something more solid, a deeper commitment to each other than one that is premised on sharing the good feelings, All right? The happiness stuff. Um, Kant, Kant does say so. Uh, so that's that little tangent. Um, Kant does say that in an ideal society, happiness and justice would converge. But in an unideal society, when you have to choose one or the other, you got to choose justice over happiness. Um, doing the right thing doesn't always promote what's good for you. doesn't always make you happy. And if you have a, a, a character that's not good, like maybe you didn't have a nice uh, childhood that we had loving parents or caregivers and good friends that encouraged your moral development to have empathy and compassion towards others, what if you just got a bunch of like nasty stuff going on inside of you? Maybe even hate, prejudice, despair, depression, cynicism, um, misanthropy, uh, <laughs> just bitterness, you know. Kant's like, you can still have access to all the meaning uh, that morality has to offer because you don't have to feel it to be a good person. You just have to do it. You have to respect those values and align your will with that good. That's all doing your duty is for Kant. Like, duty is a word, moral obligation is this word that conveys all this other baggage, especially about conformity against your will, and someone putting this baggage onto you that restricts your, like this monkey on your back, keeps you from doing what you want, something like that. But for Kant, he doesn't have all that baggage. When he, means, when he says the word duty, all he means is the action of aligning your will with what's good. That's all. That's all that it is. And you don't have to feel it. Um, you just have to do it. Okay, so what does that mean about what happens when things go wrong? What does it mean to violate the categorical imperative? Um, as I've already been talking about in this lecture, the law comes from you. You are the authority. You are the judge that your actions are held accountable to. Um, but it's the part of you that's not contingent. It's the part of you that's necessary. The categorical imperative is a necessary component to anything you're going to will or judge is good. And that's the law that you're then subject to. It's the one that has the, the binding force of absoluteness because it's necessary for you to will anything. Okay, So the, the law is coming from inside. Uh, it's a self-governing thing. And I said, you know, this usually generates a worry about relativism, but the universality thing helps with that. Okay, So I'm, I'm kind of moving quickly here because we've already talked about some of this. 
So when we act immorally, we're not holding immoral rules for action. That's usually how I'd think about it, right? There's some external authority, and instead of following that, uh, we follow our own wills. But for Kant, that's not possible. Not for reason. Uh, if reason is the one determining your will, the only way it can determine the will is by respecting the categorical imperative, law of non-contradiction, and all the rest of the things that follow from it. So the only way you could do an action that fails to have moral worth, this phrase I've been using from class, um, is if you're not the one actually willing the action. That it's not coming from reason, but instead it's coming from inclinations. So as we've talked about many times, um, here let me pull up that picture again. Um, you know, we had this diagram uh, from way back when we started talking about Kant. Um, our wills are not completely our own. They're, they are, uh, they can be determined through reason, but they can also be determined through laws of inclination. Remember my discussion of how Kant thinks we're kind of like the beings that can write our own programming, but we're also kind of like that boulder that's just subject to the laws of nature, like gravity. You know, can't help itself, but it's just going to be acted upon. Why is my computer so slow? <laughs> okay, this is going to pop up eventually. We'll get to it. Um, but you remember that distinction between, you know, I have an action uh, that's determined by the will, but the will can be determined through these two different forces. The force of self-generated laws, the reason, and the, the laws of inclination that are these natural laws. Is it here now? Here we got it? Yeah, here we go. Here's that picture again. Right, so the will can be determined by either one of these things or both, right? So um, going back here for a second. Um, so if we're going to violate the categorical imperative, it has to be a case of one of these following cases. And it, and it matches to the map. So one way that we could fail to have an action that's in line with the categorical imperative down here is uh, either we don't reason at all, we just act reactively, no thought, no intentionality behind it, you know, just like something happens uh, that stimulates us to act and we just react. That's it, like see in red, that kind of thing. The other way, though, is we engage reason and we reflect a little bit on what to do, um, but we only consider hypothetical maxims instead of categorical ones. And this is a case I talked about in class last week where um, I'm, it's basically inclinations that are determining the ultimate end of my action but reason is sort of helping it along like a, I rationalize to myself the things I desire or it's like I really desire this but I'm gonna drum up some rational excuse for it right then reasons not determining why I'm doing not fully only partially or another example this would be means ends rationality that I, I have my desire but now I just want to be smart about how I execute on it um, I'm going to think through the best strategy for getting what I want. But reason isn't determining the end, only the means. right? Reason helps me strategize, but it's I'm not subjecting to rational criticism or critical thinking whether I ought to have the desire or goal that I want to act on. right? Reason's just on executing on that plan rather than thinking about what the plan ought to be. The last one, though, is the one that Kant thinks is actually the most common. I don't know if that's true. I think the second one is pretty common. Um, but the, the last one Kant says is, I, I engage reason, so I'm in the world of self-generated laws, and I consider hypotheticals, but I do consider the categorical imperative. Remember, we talked about hypo acting on hypothetical maxims is not evil. Um, I'm going to have to do that at some point. I need to think about the means, but I also need to think about the end. And the end, determined from reason, looks like the categorical imperative. So I recognize my ultimate moral duty, or what's the sort of ultimate authority of how I, what I should be doing, what I should be aimed at. But Kant says, in this third scenario, we don't respect it. Okay, so it's like, I know what's right, but I don't follow it. Back on, on the chart here, actually, I shouldn't have... Uh, put it down right away. Remember here Kant said in the third proposition of morality that it's not just enough for me to be able to think up the moral law, but I also need to respect reason in order for me to ultimately act on it. Now what does Kant mean by respect here? There's been a lot of brouhaha about this and among philosophers over the centuries, and maybe I'm thinking about this too simplistically, but it, it seems to me very easily resolvable. The concern has always been that 
this respect requires some emotional thing, like some aspect of character or inclination. I don't think it does. I think what Kant has in mind with respect for reason goes back to logic. The way in which I respect that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's not because of how I feel about it. It's not how I feel about math, the emotions I have or the desires I have that make me respect that. It's kind of like respecting how, how else could it be? Like nothing else makes sense. How else could morality be but the categorical imperative? Anything else is going to be contradictory and unintelligible. I can't seriously maintain selfishness as a doctrine for life. It's irrational. When I, when I actually put it before my mind, the like proof for the categorical imperative, it's just like there, there's no other possible answer for how this could go. That's the kind of respect Kant has in mind. So if I was going to disrespect reason, it can't be reason that's motivating the disrespect. It's got to be something else, something like inclinations. In this third way in which things can go wrong for Kant, um, I'm basic, it's kind of like temptation. I know what's right, and I'm utterly convinced of it intellectually and rationally but i just don't want it i'm like what am i gonna do but i want that but i want to do that that's what will make me happy that's what feels right to me as opposed to recognizing like what sort of rationally makes sense so it's the inclinations which pull our respect away from reason it can't be reason disrespecting itself that's not possible okay well the Reason can't will its own destruction, right? It can't uh, disrespect itself for all the ways in which we talked about over the last week and in and, and the beginning of this lecture, too. I, I, re, uh, I talked about that theme, that argument again from Kant. So how does that actually manifest itself? Well, Kant thinks it often looks like this. I know the universal rule. I know the duty about how everyone should be acting, but I'm going to make an exception for myself in this one case. I know it's wrong to steal, but just this once, it's okay. Or you make like a New Year's resolution to yourself. You know, I'm not going to eat more than one cookie. I'm like, I just had that cookie. I want another cookie. Maybe just this once, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit and I'll have a second cookie. That kind of thing. Um, Kant thinks a lot of immoral action depends on assuming that everyone else does the right thing, like lying. Lying only works when people assume you're going to be truthful or that that's how you ought to act kind of thing. Um, it, it requires someone... It requires this kind of everyone else is doing things the right way for the person to do the wrong thing for them to sort of be effective at it or to be even tempted to do it. That they're acting rationally and consistently with universal laws. Um, bad actors require good actors kind of thing. Um, so this exception case that I know what the rules are for everybody, but it's somehow different for me. And I like how for Kant... Uh, he really ends up highlighting, this is just a side note, but it ends up highlighting how the kind of common pattern to immoral action that falls out from this is the ego. The ego which thinks it's better than everybody else in a way that's utterly arbitrary and illogical and un -def indefensible. Uh, like, what makes you so special? That the, there's the rules for everybody, but not for you. You know, they don't, the rules don't apply to you. There's the law, but you're above the law. No. No. That narcissistic fantasy is just absurd. It's irrational. That's Kant's story about it. But he thinks this is pretty common, that we do this all the time. Um, that we uh, we end up sacrificing reason in this sort of way. Kant always says, uh, he, I mean, for all this optimism, he's, he's kind of cynical by human nature, too. He, there's a quote from The Grounding where he's like, Everywhere we turn, we encounter our dear self. And it's definitely intended in that ironic tone, the dear self, the ego, that we give this unjustified priority to um, this arbitrary uh, legitimacy that it doesn't really deserve. At the same time, though, that Kant rejects this narcissistic ego as like the core mistake, the core moral mistake of most of our ac bad acting, um, our bad faith acting, he has a theory that really upholds the basis on which you have important, utterly uncontestable dignity and value as a person. That's really interesting to me, the way in which um, the dream that the ego has of this unconditional legitimacy, it doesn't get through itself, but only when it is 
dissolved, so to speak. A lot of Kantian uh, living is is the dissolution of the ego. Okay, I'm I'm waxing poetically now, so I should stop. So for Kant, immorality is giving up freedom. Like in this last case, uh, we we know what's right, but we don't follow it. We give up acting in a self-determined way to get their desires. We treat ourselves and our own will as a means for our desires instead of respecting it for itself. Um, I think I want to leave you with this sort of idea. Oh yeah, here's this quote. Love as an inclination cannot be commanded. Love resides in the will and not in the propensities of feeling and principles of action and not in tender sympathy. That's the quote I was alluding to earlier. So for Kant, um, we cannot uh, act immorally without acting unfreely. So I sometimes like to pose this to my students and saying Kant doesn't believe in evil. Uh, what evil is is a debate a lot of philosophers have gotten into, and there's different views of it out there. But let's just grant for the sake of argument or just take as a premise here that evil is intentional wrongdoing. You know, when someone hurts you by accident, you might be annoyed at them, but you're, we're generally ready to forgive that. You know, sometimes we resent it a little bit, but but it can't be. It's it's not. It's definitely not in the same ballpark as that person who intends you harm, or it seem it seems like they intend harm. Right, that they they act purposefully against you. That seems like it's on a different level. And I think there's a meaningful distinction there. But Kant would say, when you really unpack it, no one actually can intend evil. Not in this full sense. That if they don't follow the categorical imperative, if they're doing something immoral, if they're violating what's right, in a way, they're just being a boulder. They're a victim to causality. Um, and they are to be pitied, um, rather maybe rather than resented. Maybe pity is a better fit reaction. That it's like they're not empowered. That when people act wrongly, uh, like let, let's say someone um, does unjust things in the pursuit of power, they think they're empowered by doing so. But Kant would say, that's just deceiving themselves. They've lost the most important type of power, in pursuing external power, they've given up uh, self-governance, the the power over one's own will to be self-determining. That has been sacrificed on the altar of this external power, um, and they've basically acted in a in a way that dehumanizes themselves, that ignores their own dignity as being a self-determining creature. That's a really powerful argument. Now, it might seem really abstract. You're like, yeah, that's not going to convince any of these assholes I meet out in the world who are doing this kind of stuff. But I think there's, uh, if you could get them to sincerely entertain the argument, there's some real force to that. Uh, there's some persuasive force to that uh, line of thinking, I think. Um, maybe this is something we can talk about on Monday together when we unpack this lecture uh, video. But um, I think that's worth reflecting on a little bit. Um, for Kant... When people do wrong, their own state is not ideal. And to care about them, then the way that we're supposed to care about all people, according to the third, for, third formulation of the categorical imperative, means we want to liberate them in a way that encourages them to be self-determining and empowered. And that means helping to promote their ability to be moral. So instead of throwing the immoral people to the wolves kind of thing, uh, Kant would also be a philosopher, or Kantian ethics would be an, a philosophy that I think naturally dovetails with things like restorative justice. That's like, we, we should be caring for criminals. That people do wrong, stand in need of help. Um, they're not in the good state that a human is supposed to be in, in all the ways that we say are intrinsically valuable. The way in which we're worried about their victims, the reason why what they're doing is wrong and immoral, is the same principle which commands us to care about them and help them to develop better character where they can be responsive to the moral law. They can be responsive to human rights, stuff like that. Um, that's, it's really, it's, it's a weird world living in Kant's mind here uh, in the vision that he has for morality. It turns a lot of our natural moral intuitions on their head, I think, a little bit, or at least challenges them a little bit uh, and asks us to be a little bit more consistent. Okay, this video has gone on for a long time. I could definitely keep talking about it, but I think this is a good little download for us um, and gets us into um, a lot of the material that you're going to see picked up on by uh, the philosophers we're coming up 
uh, on in the weeks ahead. Uh, specifically, I can I can uh, alert you to right now. The Sen and Nest Bomb thing I've mentioned a couple times in this lecture. Rawls is going to be a real big one. And a lot of the philosophers that are going to discuss Rawls. Uh, Rawls is a big stone in the pond, just like Kant was a big stone in the pond. And they're doing very similar things. Um, and a lot of the criticisms of Rawls are, you can maybe anticipate and think about criticisms of Kant, or some of the hotter takes that Kant's theory has had are, are going to be reflected in, in the concerns people have about Rawls' approach to social justice as well. Um, but the values that Kant's throwing on the table here, uh, the dignity of self-determination uh, and autonomy and agency uh, and the necessity of human rights and uh, and the, the um, non-coercive uh, social organization and consensus, these are, these are themes we're going to see a lot in liberal political philosophy. Uh, and even in some of the critics of liberalism too. So... Uh, I think that's good. Uh, let me give you a code word. I need a code word. Um, what's a good one here for us for Kant? Um, oh man, I'm starting to turn into a pumpkin. I've kind of given up all my energy. Um, how about... Uh, <laughs> okay, let's do this. So, um, you know, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I even mentioned it already in this one, but in this v video. But uh, uh, very much the the science fiction equivalent of Kant's perpetual peace, Kingdom of Ends, or the League of Nations, the sort of evolution of League of Nations, United Nations, would be Star Trek's United Federation of Planets, um, which is really big on promoting agency and autonomy. All the member worlds, they, they don't expand through conquest, they expand through mutual invitation. Um, that the people, the, the races and planets that decide to be members of the Federation do so willingly. They're able to leave the Federation when they want. Um, nothing is coerced uh, as much as possible. Um, and so the code word I'm going to give you for this video is United Federation of Planets. Let's put that in there. Um, that would be a good one. Good, good homage to uh, Kant's Kingdom of Ends here. All right, um, I want to again invite everyone to uh, reach out to me for side conversations outside of class. I've been grading journals, and there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I mean, I, I the weekend update email, the end of it. I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass. Uh, I'm really interested in I think so many people in this class are bringing really cool ideas I, I see the sincerity with which people are engaging with the material um, and from uh, those of you I have had the privilege to talk to it's been great and I uh, want to encourage more of that and if you needed some practical reason for maybe doing this um, there is going to be a paper project this quarter and as we're getting a few weeks into the quarter here, it might be time to start thinking about that, of like what you might want to do. What's something in political, the political universe that you want to get into a philosophical debate or discussion about? A lot of the things that you've been talking about in journals or asking me about or showing up in reading comments or reactions you've had to the stuff we've been talking about is fodder for a paper. Um, and as we start getting into more political philosophy stuff, be thinking about that. Um, but I, if I if I could teach, if this was the only class I was teaching this quarter, and all of you were willing to do it, I would love to be on the phone with every single one of you every week. They were like touching base and talking about and processing all the stuff that's going on. There's so many interesting things that you're weighing and reacting to and asking questions about. It's fantastic. And and I'm busy, and I'm sure you're busy, And but let's try to make uh, as much... Uh, opportunity as possible for for helping you get the most out of this class. I'm very much a willing participant for that, and um, and I actually have some more evening time for phone calls than uh, I, I'm not like full up on that, like I've been saying. So uh, I want to invite you to do that again too. So paper project will be a practical thing sooner or later. Uh, so earlier that you get a beat on it, and we can start talking about direction and vision, bring it into focus, the better. Okay, I will sign off. I uh, hope this was valuable. Um, hope to help to clarify a lot of things for you about what's going on. Make things click. Write down all the questions you've got. Uh, let's talk about them on Monday. Looking forward to that session. Okay, take care. Have a good weekend.